You know, one of the most powerful themes found in the Bible is that of purpose. You know, the why behind our existence, the purpose we have in living this life. Don't worry, I'm not going to try and answer that question or tell you what the meaning of life is, because I believe, in fact, it was answered best by a group of much wiser men when they wrote the shorter catechism of our faith. And they said this, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, to, in to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You see, there's a recurring theme in the Bible in which I believe is almost the foundation for this statement. Um, which you can find it in Luke, you can find it in Deuteronomy, and you can find it in Mark uh, chapter 12, 29 through to 31. Jesus is asked this question about what is the greatest commandment? And he says this, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. You see, our purpose and our commandment given to us by God is this, to love him with all our heart, with all our minds, and with all our strength. So this begs the question, how can we outwork this? How can we live out this purpose? Uh, how can you express your love for God with all your mind, all your heart, and with all your strength? You know, with our head, our hearts, and our hands. I remember the first time I told Charlotte I loved her. Um, we had just come back from a date and we were just sitting there talking about anything and everything, watching time go by and suddenly uh, the moment grew silent and, and I was trying to muster up the strength and the courage to confess uh, my feelings for her. And all that came out was, I, I think I love you. And I'll never forget her response. She, she simply said back, you think? You see, I definitely fumbled that expression of love. And here's the point. How can we better express the love for God with our heads, our hearts and our hands, as mentioned in that scripture? So love the Lord with all your mind. What are you looking at? What are the things that you're thinking about? What happens in here, in your head? Um, this determines where we end up, where we are going, even how we express our love. Proverbs 4, 24, verse, verses 24 to 27 says this, Let your eyes look forward, fix your gaze straight ahead, carefully consider the path for your feet, and all your ways will be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left, keep your feet away from evil. Here we see that it's important to notice the things that hold our gaze, that hold our attention, as this ultimately decides where we go and what we do. You know, I still remember, I'll never forget this time when a deer hit me. You heard that right? A deer hit me. I did not hit the deer. I'm innocent, Your Honor. I did not hit the deer. The deer hit me. Let's just make that super clear. I was driving home one night and don't worry, it was a different night to the night that I confessed my love to Charlotte, by the way. But I was driving home one night and um, I spotted this deer just over to the right of the right lane that I was driving in. And I quickly looked to my left, I looked behind me and I could see that there were cars in both lanes. We were driving at pretty high speeds, um, still within the speed limit, your officer. Um, and whilst we were doing so, I noticed, yeah, there's this deer just sitting there. And I thought, well, I can't change lanes. I can't stop or slam the brakes. I don't want to endanger anyone around me. So I realized that if this deer should run across, uh, it would most likely hit me first before anyone else. And so what did I do? I simply, I gripped the steering wheel of my 97 Barina and um, held tight, kept my gaze straight ahead, fixed on the road. I couldn't afford to think about what the deer was going to do or what the deer wouldn't do. I couldn't be distracted. I had to make sure that I kept the car steady. And as it turned out, the, the deer did hit me, but I managed to keep the car in the lane and I managed to get home safely. And, and just as important as it was for me to hold my eyes and stay on the road, it's important for us to love God with all our minds. And what does that require? It requires us to be focused on Him, to hold our attention on Him. You see, in this world that has so many algorithms trying for your attention and vying for your attention, will you choose to set your eyes and set your mind on God? 
How can you prioritize God this week, every week, so that you, you keep him front of mind in your life? We see this example as well from Moses, doing so in Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 to 4. It says this, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Moses, the same man who got, who he saw God part seas through him, saw God move through him powerfully where he brought down pillars of fire and literally dropped food from heaven. It all started with one decision. He chose to stop and he chose to look and focus on God. What about us? How often do we stop? How often do we stop and make sure we are setting our gaze, our focus on God? Often the first step in encountering God and hearing from him actually begins with the decision to turn aside and fix our eyes on him. So what are you looking at? Because loving God with all our mind requires first for us to focus on him. I truly believe that our God will meet your decision. He's a God of decisions. And just like with Moses, he will meet with you today. When we choose to focus on God, he then speaks to us, and especially to the matters close to our heart. Moses was deeply passionate about this purpose that God was about to speak to him about. And we can see that God will speak to the things of our heart. So what about loving the Lord with all our heart? All our heart. What are the passions that God has placed in your heart? What are the things that he's given you, the dreams, the things that keep you up at night, the things that you wish you could change? I remember my very first concert that I went to was John Mayer back in 2019. I had been listening to his music for quite a while. And as someone who also plays guitar, I could deeply appreciate how much skill was involved, how much talent and uh, was on display that night. I, look, I'll tell you that I felt the pain of growing the calluses in these fingers as I was learning to play the countless hours of practice that seemingly fly out the window uh, the second someone begins to watch you play. Yet at that night, I witnessed someone who was much more skilled and talented than I am play guitar to a level of precision beyond anything I'd ever seen. I appreciated it more because it was personal, because I cared about it. I play guitar. See, loving God, serving God means getting personal. In fact, if it's not personal, it's not powerful. Some of the most incredible stories and testimonies I've heard required things to get personal. And God will use the things that are most personal to you, nearest and dearest to your heart. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 2 to 3 says this, And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing that you are not sick? There is nothing, this is nothing but sad, sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves lies in ruins? Its gates have been destroyed by fire. You see, to give you a bit of context here, Nehemiah chapter one, we see Nehemiah learns that his homeland has been destroyed and ravaged by war. Jerusalem was completely destroyed and he wept for days. He fasted and prayed over the space of four months. That's roughly how much time it takes from Nehemiah chapter one to chapter two, where we just read this passage. And we see that after four months, Nehemiah um, is here. He's still struck by it. And he's, he's in the presence of the king. And, and the king can clearly see that there is a burden on his heart. There are certain burdens that God places on our hearts. And he does that for a reason. There are certain passions that we have. And maybe that's for you today. God has given you a spiritual burden on your heart. He's given you a passion for a specific, um, specific cause. Maybe it's through your work. Maybe it's even beyond the context of a Sunday morning. You see, some of the greatest ways I've experienced the love of God actually haven't been through a Sunday morning sermon, but through the kindness and passion shown by fellow believers just in the day to day. And I want to tell you that it's OK to use your passions and dreams to further God's kingdom. 
Sometimes we get caught in this false dilemma that we have to choose. We have to choose, choose either pursue the kingdom of God or pursue our, our dreams and our hopes. But what if I told you we could do both? Keeping God front of mind and at the center as our main focus, as we just said, while we work, while we study, while we serve our families and our communities. Nehemiah was still at work here. You see, that's how he met the king. And he would have actually been better off being at work because that's how the king managed to help Nehemiah. The king gave him resources. The king provided assistance towards that cause. If he had called in sick to work, then he would have been worse off. So what are the things that are on your heart? This is more good news here. We also see later on that Nehemiah finishes rebuilding the city, rebuilding the wall and the gates of Jerusalem. He achieves the dream that God placed on his heart. And I firmly believe that our calling and our, and our purpose in life is not just to serve God out of obligation with the minimum amount of obedience required, but to love him with all our hearts, wholeheartedly, with all our passions that he's given us, to use them to represent Christ in our community. So again, what are some of the passions God has placed on your heart? Perhaps you're still in the, purpose, in the process of discovering this purpose, of discovering this passion. And I know that as you give him your focus, as we said before, God will reveal this to you. Psalm 37 verse four says, take the light in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. So love the Lord with all your heart. How are you using your passions to express your love for God? To love the Lord with all your strength, your hands now, what is in your reach? What is something you can do this week? You know, everything I've said up until this point comes with the proviso, the precondition that it is followed it up with action, that we follow it up with action. James 1.22 says this, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. First Peter 4.10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. Following the legacy of our founding pastor, Mark, um, I now want to use a running analogy. I've been trying to get fit this year and run a bit more um, just to be more physically active and, and try and increase my cardio fitness. And in all my pursuits, I've I've managed to watch countless reels to save multiple videos and tutorials on the best stretches and exercises. I've, I've planned my calendar and my week so that I can make time for it. But guess what? None of this actually matters until I lace up my shoes and I start running. It can be so easy to overthink things or to set needless prerequisites. I'll start doing this when I get to that place, or I need to achieve, read, prepare X before I can then do Z. Well, let's, let's put that out the window. What can we do right now? What do we have within our hands right now? Regardless of how small, or what are the things that we have in our reach and that we can actually control right here, right now? I could tell you that I'd love to go to a remote village in the Amazon rainforest and share the gospel with the, with the hidden tribe that has never heard of Jesus before. But it won't mean much if, if I'm not even able to show love to the people at my work on a Wednesday afternoon. If I can't serve him with what I have in my hands right now, how can I say for sure I will do so when, things, when I have the things I don't even have yet? When Moses got this miss mission from God, and in that same burning bush moment, God didn't tell Moses to then go forge a sword or a spear. He simply asked, what is in your hand? And then God used that same old shepherd's staff that he'd been using every day. When thousands of people were hungry and this young man came forward to Jesus and all he had to offer was a few loaves of bread and some fish, Jesus didn't say, this isn't enough. He took what was there, he took what was in his hands and he multiplied it. When we take what's in our hands and we offer it to God, this isn't, and this isn't just about money, it's about time, it's about our everyday actions, it's about the things that we do every day. God takes it and he uses it and miracles happen 
when we serve God with what we have in our hands, God is glorified. Loving God with all our strength means more than just grand gestures. It means serving him with the small, consistent, everyday actions we make. Being consistent in our pursuit for God, single-mindedly, wholeheartedly, and with both hands, is ultimately how we give him our true worship and how we live out this purpose we have as believers. So again, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength, head, heart, hands. Again, what are the things that you are choosing to focus on? How can you place God at the forefront of your mind today? And with your heart, what are some of the things that you're passionate about? How can you give these dreams or use these dreams, I should say, given to you by God to glorify Him? How can you use these dreams to shape your expression of servitude? And hands, what are some of the things you can do today? Who are the people in your world within your reach? What is one small action you can do today? How can you share the gospel and represent Christ today, this week? How can you express and outwork your love for God this week using your head, your heart, and your hands? Can I pray for you now? Father God, thank you, Lord, for creating us and giving us this purpose. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you may speak to our hearts, that you may inform our minds, Lord, and that you may guide our hands and that you may help us to be Christ in our communities, in our families, in our workplaces, in our places of studies, so that we can love you and express our love towards you every day. In Jesus' name, amen.